A very good afternoon to you all. On behalf of the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, I welcome you to this third webinar session on infection control guidelines. So we have our esteemed speakers today, Professor Aruna Lok Chakrabarti, who is the head of medical microbiology at PGI Chandigarh. We have Professor S.K. Ratho, who is the head of Department of Virology at PGL, and Dr. Neeraj Nagpal, who is from the Medical Legal Action Group and the director of Hope Clinic Chandigarh. So we, without taking much of time, we will take you straight to Professor Aruna Lok Chakrabarti, who will talk about guidelines on the use of personal protective equipments at PGI Chandigarh. All the way to Professor Chakrabarti. Okay. Good afternoon to all. Uh... I have been asked to discuss uh, on the PPE. The issue in case of this PPE is most confusing in today what we are seeing throughout the country. It's also in our institute we are facing the similar problem. Now people think about what is PPE exactly. PPE is the personal protective equipment. Now people think in that sense like personal protective equipment should be having like robotic suit or something like a space suit which should be there. So just see that even what I am wearing, this is a surgical mask and this surgical mask is also part of PPE. If we use N95 mask, that's also a part of PPE. If I have to take the goggles, that's also part of PPE. Even when we are having this particular dress, which can be water resistant, that is also a part of PPE. Even shoe cover, head cover, that can be also part of PPE. So here the question is, which area, what type of PPE is required? Now you all know that this particular coronavirus, they are acquired through the droplet and that is coming directly through our respiratory route, what is the infection which we can acquire from the another person or from the patient. So as a healthcare personnel, if you have to think about what is the real need of this different PP, I would like to say first is that whatever the PP which should be there first, we need the proper training in this aspect. Now training is that like suppose if I have to take out this particular mask which I am wearing, most important thing is that a lot of people what they are doing is that they are touching the front of the surface. That's the most likely chance of contamination. So here you have to take care that you don't touch on the front of the surface. Whether you are wearing N95 or whether you are wearing any of this PP, that is the most important aspect which people are not realizing. I have seen people are roaming around like this. You see, this is the way. So here the front surface is getting contaminated on your the body or the shirt which I am wearing. I am going everywhere and even in the house, if I go with this particular shirt, I can contaminate my family members with this aspect. So the question comes now, what should be the which area, what type of PPE which should, should use? Now in case of the surgical mask, surgical mask can also uh, prevent uh, the spread of virus to a considerable extent. Like if you see in case of our surgical mask, this prevents entry of the virus up to 60%. So when you are roaming around in the hospital, first thing is that you must have at least the surgical mask, that's very important. You know, people think that when people are coughing, they are spreading this infection. That's not only true only. Even when I am speaking, there is a chance that I am spreading some droplets. So initially, the, when the concept came at the beginning, that people who are not having any symptoms should not wear any mask. But when I realized that different studies which had come out that even with the person while speaking can also spread the droplets and there are also people who can be asymptomatic, carry the virus. Then we started doing this universal masking. 
In our institute, we started this universal masking for almost now a month. Whoever enters in our hospital, whether it is healthcare personnel or it is a patient or patient family, first thing is done is that you hand sanitize so that there is a chance that you may carry this organism in your hand. Next is everyone is given this surgical mask. N95 mask is required where you are really uh, taking care of a patient who is either COVID positive or COVID suspect. Now, in case of our hospital, any patient coming in our hospital, whether it is a uh, surgical uh, patient, whether it is a medicine patient or any patient who is coming, they first go to the triage area. Now, in the triage area, all the healthcare personnel should have proper protective gear. So, what we have done in that particular area is that we have given them N95 mask along with that having the proper dress because you know patient may suddenly uh, cough on you, they can have certainly uh, several body secretion which may come out. That's why we are putting them with this proper body which is uh, protective equipment which is water impervious so that it cannot any of this droplet or anything which is coming, it should not go inside your body and uh, contaminate your uh, inside garment. It is desirable that in all the hospitals, if possible, which we could not also do, that while you come inside the hospital, every healthcare personnel, which generally in case of Western world they do, that is you go into the draping, you wear the hospital dress, and keep your material in the locker and while going out of the hospital you take out your material and send the draping for the washing and cleaning. Now in case of this uh, a patient who is coming say suppose in case of this triage area where we have given all the personnel, they will have N95 mask. They have given a face shield. Face shield is also very important you know Face shield can protect a lot of things. You can have the goggles. Yes, goggles is important, but sometimes like I am wearing a specs. The goggles should not allow any area gap in it. So something like a swimmer's goggles would be very useful in this situation. Next is that if you have face shield, these are the three important things. N95 mask, goggles, and this face shield. If we have this one, it protects you a lot. Along with that, the impervious garment, which is water resistant garment, would be useful when there is any aerosol generating procedure is being done. Say, suppose you have got an intuition, or suppose you are uh, uh, attending a patient in the dental clinic, or suppose you are looking to the ENT area where people are looking into the throat area, there are a lot of aerosols which are produced, where we need the proper PPE protection. Now in COVID area, we have clearly made full PPE system. That means where there is the COVID patient is there, there we have putting this head cover, shoe cover, then the impervious, uh, this is which is water resistant gown, and then along with that, the N95 mask, goggles, Shield. But in other area, like suppose initially we didn't have an emergency uh, people with this N95 mask. But the concern which came into this area, like suppose any patient which can be missed in the triage area. Now, in case of this particular coronavirus disease, we are still not very clear. Yes, we know that there is this uh, particular uh, the severe acute respiratory infection which is being considered as sari which is being considered as important. But some of the patient may also present with say suppose loss of smell, there can be some giddiness or confusion and some of the patient may have cerebrovascular accident. So because of seeing those features, we have upgraded in case of our emergency regarding this, in, uh, regarding this personal protective things. What we have now done is that in the emergency area, all the healthcare personnel 
is now wearing N95 mask along with the face shield and along there is the water resistant gown. These are the three things which they are needed in case of uh, emergency area. Now there are certain times, certain issues which crop up. Like suppose a patient who has come already on labor. Now here in the labor when it is, uh, you cannot go through this uh, triage area because you have to immediately put into the labor room or there is need of putting into OT. So they are uh, for cesarean section. So what we have done is that we have made one separate uh, OT as well as labor room in such type of situation when we could not screen the patient properly and there is full PP is there thinking that there can be this patient can have COVID so that taken care but of course this patient is being tested uh, for ultimately after the operation or after the labor whether this patient is carrying uh, COVID or not if it is negative then the patient goes to the normal ward in that sense. Otherwise, the patient are put into the COVID ward. So, in this way, we have different areas. Like suppose, people started thinking in case of the radiology, what are the precautions required? You know, uh, again I am trying to say is that in COVID patient, until unless you are very sure that you are taking proper precaution, uh, possibly uh, at uh, present where you are doing the CT or MRI, where you are using the normal patient, until unless you have got a dedicated CT or MRI for the COVID patient, don't mix up the things, that's very important. You can use the portable X-ray, portable ultrasound which can be dedicated for this area, so that at least you don't take out this to the another area for using this aspect. But whoever is entering in the COVID area, it's not only the doctors and nurses, I would say that even the technician, even the Safai Karmchari or hospital attendant, they should all wear this particular protective equipment. This would be important, especially when those who are carrying the waste, you know, this is in happened in our own institute. Uh, there were two patients, two persons, hospital personnel, who are working in COVID suspect area, uh, they become positive. Now there can be two reasons for this. One thing is that they were going home and from the home they can acquire from the community or there is a chance that during the doffing process, there is chance of getting contaminated. I would say that donning is important. You need to train how to go for donning this particular personal protective equipment, more important is the doffing part. Lot of people I have seen first take out the N95 mask. That is the last thing you should take out. First you, when you have come out, you are going for the doffing, you are having two gloves, double gloves which you are using. First gloves you clean with spirit, which is there as a sanitizer. Then once you have done it, then remove your shoe cover, you can remove your head cover if it is there, you can remove the face shield. Then you have to remove this uh, impervious gown. While removing this impervious gown, most important thing is that you should not touch on the surface. You have to train this aspect that so that your material can be taken out without touching the surface. That's very important. You have to rotate in the opposite direction in such a way that the outer surface go inside. And once you have done this, then you have to clean again your hand. Then you have to remove the N95 mask. These are the steps which are required. And lastly, you remove the gloves, which is the last gloves which have. Then you wash your hand. And I suggest now which you are implementing also, it's better you take a bath and then you remove your dripping and wear the clothes and can go out. So these are the process in case of personal protective equipment which are required. If anyone have you any question, you can ask me. I have not shown any slide because this is more interactive, which is more important rather than just showing few slides. If anyone has any question, because we like to, I am going for another meeting. I would love to have all the question now itself if it is there. Thank you, sir, for your nice talk. Uh, there are two questions here. 
first is can simple or cloth face mask project people from uh, protect people from covid 19 you know this simple mask is not for the hospital care person or health care person this simple mask is required for the people around in the community for two reasons one aspect is that while talking he is not spreading at the same time he is not coming here simple mask can protect up to 50% like this is protecting up to 70% that simple mask can use up to 50% then why we are not allowing asking them to use surgical mask the reason is this surgical mask you cannot use repeatedly once you have used in a day then you have to throw it properly in case of biological waste whereas in case of the uh, ordinary cloth mask you have to wash it yourself don't ask your wife or the maid to wash it the reason why i am telling you again they may not be knowing which is the surface which was outside is better you do the cleaning wash it keep it in the sun or make it dry so at least two or three pairs of this mask would be useful for you when you are in the community but in case of healthcare personnel i always say that it is the surgical mask is required and daily you should change the surgical mask uh, sir one question is uh, how to disinfect your spectacles after covid duty that you wear under goggles excellent this particular question is also with me i discussed with the center for disease control atlanta on this issue they are saying that it is better that if you just use the spirit or the sanitizer lotion which you are using with a uh, particular tissue paper which is soaked with it clean your specs and then you add this one once it becomes dry so generally in other situation like in case of our face shield uh, we put it in case of the sodium hypochlorite 1% and then it can be dried and can be used but some of these spectacles are expensive and also very important for your thing you cannot throw it out in case of the face shield if it is suppose after 10 use or 5 use or whatever it is you can throw it so in case of spectacle sodium hypochlorite though would be good but sodium hypochlorite is also corrosive to certain extent so in case of spectacle this is i discussed with them and they have also the same query which have been ultimately experts say that it is with the 70% alcohol if we wipe it out that's good but when you are going to the covid area please use along with it the goggles so that your the spectacles don't get so much contaminated you can move the goggles not the spectacles that's very important uh, sir last question is that how to disinfect mobile phones again it's better not to carry your mobile phone inside in case of our own institute whoever is going into the covid area uh, we are not allowing this uh, mobile phone person mobile phone to carry we have kept mobile phone for connecting them with the outside uh, which is dedicated mobile phone it has got fixed number which is being used because we need to have communication to the inside staff with the outside who are monitoring it but suppose if you have to carry it first thing is that try don't use while we are examining the patient mobile phone is one of the area where there is a chance that you carry this thing because we are so accustomed of using mobile phone whenever there is a phone call comes while seeing a patient you may take out the mobile phone it is better while doing this examination of the patient or say suppose sitting at the opd please switch off the mobile so that you need not have to take off the mobile even after this i would say that the 70 percent alcohol uh, which uh, sanitizer which is being used that is good for mobile once you wipe it then with a dry cloth uh, clean it that can be done but again i am repeatedly saying is that don't use this mobile phone because ultimately mobile phone you are putting on your ear if you are not cleaning that properly even you can carry your this organism on your face and somehow or other our bad habit or whatever our tics you may say that we touch our face quite frequently in our day and that would be one of the important reason that we can spread this infection so that would be very important thank you sir thank you sir thank you all for uh, 
having your patience to hear about it. If there is any question about this PP, you can send me the question, I can come again and can try to do this because whole PP uh, particular exercise in PGI, it has been evolved. There were a lot of issues like suppose whether you can reuse this uh, N95 mask or not, which you have not asked, possibly we can take it in later any of the other webinar. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ronaldo, for uh, such a deep insight into the personal protective equipments. And before we get back with our second yeah. speaker, who is Dr. Professor R.K. Ratho, he will be speaking about infection control and universal precautions in virology. We will just take less than a minute to get back. Well, welcome back. So we have with us Professor R.K. Ratho, who is the head of the Department of Virology, and he would be speaking about infection control and universal precautions in virology. All over to Professor Ratho. Good afternoon. So I would be talking a very important concept of uh, prevention of infection, that is how we are going to have infection control and what policies and procedures we are supposed to follow when working with uh, with the samples with uh, some viral infections or age of like COVID-19, the coronavirus, SARS-Coronavirus-2 infections. So <clears throat> this is uh, the important to understand that there are uh, different guidelines uh, which are um, proposed for the universal standard precautions designed to protect the healthcare workers as a mode of its infection control measures. If you look into that, first priority is like you have to protect yourself and then it comes like the protecting your patients. Once we do these two things, we are invariably going to have protection to our family and at last to the protection to the commun community and the environment. So the in total goal is that we are supposed to have protection to all the people living with us with this deadly type of viral infections which are coming off in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, this is the most important thing what we are supposed to know about is the mode of transmission of the sars corona 2 virus which is known as the COVID-19. The most important fact is that it spreads primarily from person to person. When a person, infected patient comes, which we have the symptoms like the fever, uh, running nose, uh, sore throat and coughing and sneezing. So if that person starts sneezing or coughing, we are expected to have in the release of uh, droplets. The droplets which will have the bigger size and weight with uh, carrying the viruses, usually known to travel around two to three feet to a maximum. Majority of these uh, droplets, they are going to settle down in the floor within two to three feet distance. That's why it is always said that if a person comes beyond this space, uh, then there is very, very less chance that the person is going to get uh, infected with the 
a, a patient who is coming in contact. So that is what is being said at this keeping social distancing, the very important component what we are following nowadays in our nationwide <coughs> prevention control policies. So this is one way. The other way is that once this, uh, the person who is handling the intimate objects like uh, you can say door handles, the knobs, the digital devices, the laptops, the mobile, lift buttons, whatever the things he, the person is touching, the, even towels and handkerchief and all those things, they are supposed to be infected. And if other, the other fellow once touches this type of uh, material, infected materials and this uh, hand is being taken into the nose or mouth area, then it, every chance is that we are going to get the infection <clears throat> out of that. This is because this uh, COVID-19 is a very highly infectious disease and it has got a R0 transmission rate of 2.2, that's a very high transmission. So once you understand the transmission cycle of this disease, suppose COVID-19, the virus is sars coronavirus 2 uh, with an infection to a person and uh, the port of exit would be like uh, the, the nasal secretions and throat secretions and uh, it gets transmitted uh, through the droplet infections to another susceptible person and then it, the cycle continues and the person to person transmission helps the virus to survive in the community. Now it needs to break one of these link, the chain of transmission which usually will help in decreasing the disease transmission or the disease burden. So these are the uh, very important uh, standard components, precautionary components which are really proven to be useful in, in, in reducing the burden of transmission of this sars coronavirus to infections. The most important thing is hand hygiene, then use of personal protective equipment, the respiratory hygiene and cough etiquettes, the proper waste disposal, the environmental cleaning, patient care equipment and then Designing health policies and promotion of institutional safety climates. These are the important components which uh, are uh, in, has been seen that they have got a very effective role in controlling the disease. <clears throat> of the said things, the hand hygiene is supposed to be the major component and very important standard precautions and one of the most effective methods to prevent transmission of the SARS coronavirus too. Because this infected hand, wherever it, the person touches, is going to have the contamination of that surface area or the material. <clears throat> Hence, the hand washing is one of the most important component which has to be taken in, in, in procedures like before and after any direct contact with the patient, or immediately after the removal of the gloves, once the person has used the gloves, before handling an invasive device, after handling the, the infected sam samples which are from the patients like the respiratory samples, body fluid secretions or other contaminated items and then moving from a contaminated area to a clean area in the laboratory or the department or in the wards, whatever it may be. So the hand washing is one of the most basic and the most effective method of uh, the prevention of the disease. Uh, so there are two ways of uh, doing hand washing that is use of a hand rub or you hand wash. The hand, hand rub usually it is being a alcohol paste and usually in the alcohol of a, the concentration of 70% like 60 to 80% is, is found to be very effective in destroying the virus itself. So if somebody is using a hand rub or using a hand wash, usually what is being done is that the, the material is taken on the palm then you have to clean, <coughs> make a, a uniform like a, a smoothing of the palm with this uh, hand rub or this soap water and then it is the next step one is to do the, the interlacing the fingers, the dorsum and the palm aspect, then you, you are the interlocking area, then you are supposed to do the fingers, then this is the, the thumb area which is supposed to be clean and then one is to, to keep dry in case of hand rub. And in case of uh, like somebody is using the, the soap and water, it has to clean with the soap and water and make it dry. So these are the very basic important com uh, components for the hand wash which has to be followed and uh, for a hand rub it is expected that one should use 20 to 30 seconds whereas for the hand wash it will take little more like 40 to 60 seconds time so that we have got a proper hand washing after every activity we do. We, besides this, 
we, we usually think of personal protective equipment. It's a very, very highly thought uh, concept nowadays. It is going on uh, everywhere. Everybody thinks of that personal protective equipment once it is used, it is very safe. The uh, previous speaker has already told about the use of this personal protective equipment. It is very um, selectively, it has to be worn like the, this has to be used upon risk assessment, like assessing the risk of exposure of the worker to the body fluids. And risk assessment is critical and should be done before any healthcare work so that we are going to have a proper use of a, this PPE, which has got the components like the face mask or the N95 mask, then we have got a face shield, goggles, then we have got gown, the apron, then the gloves, we have got the head cover and then shoe cover. All these components together is going to come up as a complete PP and it is a, one, one has to also look into the, the cost factor availability. Also once this PP is used, it, it, one is to keep it for five to six hours for, during use also gives a little discomfort for that. So the pro proper uh, like judgment of use of the PP has to be made before it's used. So this is uh, once somebody is going to use the PP, the donning we say and the most important important component of this use of PP is the doffing, the removal. The doffing has to be very very meticulous and it should be stringent so that by during the process of any part of the drop doffing, we are not going to get ourselves infected. And also this infected material has to be properly disposed so that the person at by the side or the people who are handling with this material for, for disposal are not going to get infected. The other most important thing what has been learned from the SARS outbreak in 2001 and 2 that the proper respiratory etiquette. Now this proper respiratory etiquette has got a very great value and with the simple methods it is going to prevent many many infections including, including other viral and other infectious agents also. So what is supposed to do is somebody is going to have a sneezing or coughing should use a tissue immediately or should if there is no tissue then he should use the upper sleeve of his own hand uh, arm and then sneeze it should not be uh, you, the hand should not be used for any sort of coughing and sneezing because once it gets con contaminated or infected this co part is going to contaminate many surfaces around which the person is going to handle and once this tissue is used it should be properly disposed into a waste basket and then the hand has to be cleaned immediately after the activity either with soap and water or with an alcohol based hand rub. The other important component one is to keep in mind when we are working with patient or we are working with the patient samples in the laboratory is the proper biomedical waste disposal. That's very very important. So the, because we are working in, in a, in a uh, mm, laboratory, we have got all the patient samples, the mm, infectious material, the laboratory waste like we are using the gloves, we are using the, the mm, uh, tips, the plastic tips, we are using the, mm, the PPE, the materials, all those things has to be properly taken out and then there is a way how to, it has to be uh, doffed in and then the, these materials has to be the pre treated with, uh, with the autoclave or uh, microwave systems are nowadays available so that it, the, before going for its proper disposal this has to be autoclaved properly sterilized and then disposed with proper tag so that these materials has to be, has to be uh, disposed as per the standard biomedical waste disposal system. In addition to that, also one has to keep in mind the environmental decontamination. The environmental decont decontamination is very important because the COVID-19 virus potentially sur can survive in the environment for several hours to days. It depends upon the different materials where it is going to stick. So the, the, the important components which are to be taken care of like the commonly used things like the door handles, the security locks, the keys, all these things, they should be wiped with 70% alcohol where the bleaching, if someone is coughing or sneezing and without following proper respiratory etiquettes, then after that this is, the seat has to be vacated and should be cleaned with 1% sodium hypochlorite. So the social distancing of maintaining one, one meter distance is also very effective in 
towards getting uh, controlling the spread of this disease. So we have got many areas like laboratory, corridors, staircase, escalators, then security booths, office rooms, meeting rooms, all these things. The best uh, solution for the sterilization is supposed to be the one portion sodium hypochlorite, the bleaching uh, solution. And there is a lot of other uh, materials have, uh, and uh, things also have been documented or listed for, uh, the, which can be decontaminated using proper de uh, <coughs> detergents. The important component which comes in a, a place where the lab people are working with the highly infectious uh, material like this uh, SARS coronavirus 2, then the, the, there should be the availability of a spill kit. Spill means uh, if the samples by mistake or the infectious material by mistake it gets spilled into the floor, then immediately it has to be taken care of. So we should have a spill kit like it should have the components like the leak proof bags, containers for the disposal of waste material, scrap and pen for the, the spills, then disposable rubber gloves and eye protection plastic aprons and then the respiratory protection devices. So these, what one has to do immediately is that vacate that area and wait for at least 30 minutes to settle the aerosols down. Then wearing gloves and footwear goggles and then these are the way how the test will be taken care of after the gloves. One is to put the absorbent material on the spilled uh, infectious material on the floor or where it has been fall, fallen in. So this depends upon the small or the large quantity. So then one has to use the sodium hypochlorite solution and then it has to spread from outer to inner side. Then gradually those things has to be mopped out, taken in and then to be properly disposed into the proper disposal bag and then take hand washing and then taken care of. <clears throat> this is what uh, the way how a infected material has to be properly disposed. There are different uh, um, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has uh, given the different guidelines for the preventive measures and containment of uh, this COVID-19. These are all those informations has already been uh, dealt with and one has to also uh, strictly uh, see that this disinfection protocols to be followed in different uh, buildings, rooms as per the environmental uh, guidelines and there should be also like maintaining personal hygiene and social distancing where it is being uh, 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 time and again told that there should not be gatherings more than five people that should be avoided. And also discouraging entry of the visitors to the buildings or the different labs where the samples are being taken care of. So the last important points what one has to keep in mind is that the PPE are the not the alternate to the most important hand hygiene and respiratory etiquettes which are very important. One, if somebody follows this hand hygiene and respiratory etiquettes, we are going to prevent majority of the transmission of this disease. Then always follow the protocol if the PP has to be used for its donning and doffing so that we are not going to get infected or going to get the infection spread to the other people who are dealing with this type of infections. And we are supposed to also maintain the distance like one meter distance from contacts or suspects or from the confirmed COVID-19 cases. There is also an important component what is required is that adequate trained staff and supplies together with the very good leadership and then there should be education of health workers, patients and visitors. All these things will uh, together going to help in the controlling the disease like COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much Professor R.K. Rathor for such a deep insight into the infection control guidelines and practices. Uh, in relation to virology and uh, before we call in our next speaker who is a guest uh, Dr. Ne Neeraj Nagpal who is from the Medical Legal Action Group uh, I would just like and request you to post your questions for Professor Ratho there is an online chat which is going on you can very well post your questions over there and we will answer all of them or rather we will try to answer all of them uh, in the end question and answer session. So we will be back in less than a minute.
So we have with us uh, Dr. Neeraj Nagpal, uh, who is from the Medical Legal Action Group of IMA Chandigarh, and he is also a director of Hope Clinic Chandigarh. All the way to Professor Nagpal, Dr. Nagpal. Well, thank you for inviting me for this session. Uh, when I was given the topic of regulatory issues and laws related to COVID, I needed to brush myself up and I'll try to do justice to the topic today. The point which is important for doctors to know is a legal principle which says that ignorance of law is no excuse. So whatever you think you know may not be uh, what is required of you as per law today. What you also need to know is India does not have a public health law. And we are fighting this COVID-19 in 2020 using Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897, 123 years old. We are also using Indian Penal Code, which was formulated in 1860. And now we are using also the Disaster Management Act of 2005, which was formulated predominantly for earthquakes, floods and these kind of uh, disasters. Besides these laws, there have been total of 488 notifications related to COVID-19 which have been issued to date. This is from 17th January 2020 when the first notification was made till uh, 20th April, this is yesterday uh, evening, we had total 488 notifications and once an order is notified, after that it is presumed that public, doctors, everybody is aware of it. It is your duty to make yourself aware of these uh, notifications. And remember, these notifications are not all related to healthcare. They are related to tourism, defense, law and order, travel, labor and employment, finance, uh, all, all fields. But 104 of these notifications are related only to health. And this is important from the doctor's point of view. What was this Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897? Basically, one of India's primary weapons against COVID-19 today was this act which was brought to fight bubonic plague which had broken out in Bombay state. It was also misused by the British to imprison freedom fighters. Totally, I think there are four sections in this. The first is basically definitions. Second is the powers which can be uh, taken over by the government to fight this epidemic. Third uh, section is regarding the punishments which are uh, available to the authorities under these, uh, this act. And fourth is a protection which is given to the authorities for action taken in good faith under this act. Till March 13, 2020, seven state governments and central government of India had invoked the powers and provisions under Epidemics Act with retrospective effect starting from 17th Jan. The other important uh, piece of legislation which is uh, being used is the Disaster Management Act of 2005. Ministry of Home Affairs had passed an order invoking this Disaster Management Act under which power of the chairman of the National Executive Committee was delegated to the Union Health Secretary. Normally, this is kept with the Union Home Secretary, but this was delegated to the Union Health Secretary because Disaster Management Act, as I said earlier, was not predominantly designed for pandemics or uh, health uh, emergencies. It was designed mainly for floods and uh, earthquakes and uh, things like that. So it has the chairmanship was handed over to the Union Health Secretary and uh, to enhance the preparedness and containment of COVID-19 on 11th March, implemented again retrospectively and is in effect from 17th January. What does Disaster, Disaster Management Act, uh, what are the actions? This was recently in news and I was very, very happy to hear this. On 15th of April, 
the Ministry of Home Affairs had issued a notification which made spitting in public now an offence under Disaster Management Act. This is something India desperately needed and we did not require a pandemic to get this order uh, in India. Now under the consolidated revised guidelines issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs on Wednesday in wake of the extensive lockdown, spitting has now been made punishable with a fine under Section 51B of Disaster Management Act and refusal to comply with government orders under Disaster Management Act may result in imprisonment up to one year or fine or both. This is what the directive has said. Under Disaster Management Act, Section 51 to Section 60 basically covers the punishments which can be given under the Act. Section 51 is punishment for obstructing any officer or employee of the central or state government and two is for refusal to comply with direction issued by the government and the punishment given is imprisonment up to one year and if your obstruction or refusal results in loss of lives or danger thereof then imprisonment up to two years is also prescribed section 54 punishment for false warning this is important because we have a lot of social media today which was not probably there in 2005 when this act was made but whoever makes or circulates a false alarm or warning as to severity or magnitude of the disaster leading to panic, the punishment prescribed is imprisonment up to one year. Please remember WhatsApp groups, Facebook messages, the ones we simply keep on forwarding. We should be careful though Information Technology Act Section 61 is no longer uh, valid after the Supreme Court decision. But under Disaster Management Act Section 54, government can take action against uh, persons uh, for this. Section 56 is failure of an officer on duty. Now, any officer on whom any duty has been imposed under this act and who ceases or refuses to perform or withdraws himself from the duty without express written permission of the superior, the is, imprisonment is one year. Why I have brought this up is, uh, recently I had got a phone call from another doctor in Delhi uh, who was deputed in Ames uh, doing uh, uh, some course uh, over there and uh, for some reason did not wish to join duty uh, because of uh, covid doctors who are who have been deputed on uh, covid duty if they make uh, a fake excuse of a sickness or an illness and uh, do not join that duty please remember section 56 of disaster management act government can take action against you and the action is for the criminal uh, prosecution with imprisonment up to one year. We also have the section 188 of IPC. This is anyway, this did not require a pandemic for this to be active and disobedience or to order duly prom promulgated by a public servant. If such disobedience causes or tends to cause riot or danger to human life or safety, this shall be uh, punished with imprisonment up to six months or with fine up to 1000 rupees or both. There are certain other sections of IPC which are also already existent and did not require a pandemic to be invoked. This is section 269 of IPC which prescribes punishment for any negligent action which may spread infection of any disease thereby threatening human life punishable with imprisonment up to six months and or fine. Section 270 imposes punishments of imprisonment up to two years and or fine for malignant actions which may spread any disease dangerous to life and section 271 of IPC prescribes punishment for disobeying quarantine rule such punishment may extend to six months imprisonment. We are all aware of this Kanika Kapoor who came uh, from abroad and uh, conducted uh, many uh, programs attended many parties. She was booked under section 269, 270 and section 188 of uh, Indian Penal Code. Next, I will take up an issue which is bothering doctors a lot and I get a lot of phone calls on. Uh, this is the notice which has been issued by the Punjab Medical Council which says some medical practitioners are neglecting and refusing duties for patients. The council has decided that any such type of unethical professional decline by doctors, serious and suitable action will be taken against defaulters. The issue was uh, Honorable Chief Minister Mr. Amrinder Singh had also made a statement that doctors who are not neglecting to see OPD should be treated like deserters. Now the problem is nowhere 
was this clarity given till now that was we were we talking about opds of hospitals or we were also talking of simple clinics which had no inpatient facility so most of the standalone clinics most of the daycare centers most of the uh, investigate the diagnostic centers uh, were unclear initially uh, of whether they were supposed to open or not because at that time lockdown was uh, the norm and similarly these clinics and these opds also were unclear how the staff is going to come because today with the in coming in of law and uh, technology into practice of medicine uh, a doctor can no longer single handedly sit on a desk and practice medicine he requires his staff he requires the equipments he requires a number of things which uh, is not possible where medical practice today is not possible without the support of these what happens when we open the opd and see all kinds of patients walk in here this doctor uh, dr nagpal only from panchkula uh, he saw a patient with the fever and uri he advised x ray and a spot was found in the lungs he prescribed antibiotics the woman later tested positive and subsequently infected her husband daughter and six other family members the doctor when he uh, uh, had seen the patient on the second visit had referred her with suspected covid to the civil hospital and in civil hospital she was tested positive the issue was when first the patient had appeared on april 2nd why the doctor had not referred at that given moment only on this issue this uh, fir was lodged plus if we look at these regulatory changes which have been brought in and private medical establishments and hospitals what are the uh, effects that these regulations are going to have let us consider from the private hospitals even corporate hospital side there is trade restrictions resulting in loss of business including medical tourism this has been clearly notified that no elective cases are to be taken only emergency cases are to be handled so obviously it has resulted in loss of business medical tourism has been hit drastically additional cost of operations due to need for providing personal protection equipment and other measures forceful shutdown of business operations along with fines and penalties levied by the regulators reputation loss due to negative media reports on failure to adopt preventive and detective measures default of contractual obligations lot of doctors may be in rented premises and they may not uh, or, or they may have uh, contracts with the equipment suppliers where they have to make monthly payments or they have to or even loans from banks uh, so default of these contractual obligations may be their damages and compensation to be paid to impact uh, infected individuals for not adopting adequate measures and criminal prosecutions against key managerial personnel and or board members if a staff member is found positive and the reason has been found that uh, the guidelines were not being followed this is another we had many advisories from the government that do not terminate employees or do, uh, do not cut their salaries uh, even the prime minister had made an appeal in this regard all these were advisories advisories are more like what my mother tells me okay beta you should not drink uh, but law is what my wife tells me uh, to do and i have to do and now we have had on 29th uh, march this notification from ministry of home affairs which under section 10 subsection 2 uh, first is uh, of the disaster management act has said that employers of private establishments do should not terminate employees or reduce their wages if any worker takes leave he should be deemed to be on duty with no consequential pay cut if the place of employment is non operational due to no covid 19 the employees of such unit will be considered on duty this is a very very serious matter uh, most establishments work on 5% 10% 15% margins and if there is no income uh, this kind of a liability will only lead to uh, shutdown of uh, institutions including medical institutions 
on request of president indian medical association there was this notification which was issued uh, that telephonic whatsapp and e consultations uh, should be given uh, to patients you have to realize but that till now teleconsultation law as it existed from 2009 the supreme court judgment of martin f disuza versus mohammed ishwak it had said very clearly that no prescription should ordinarily be given without actual examination and the tendency to give a prescription over telephone except in an acute emergency should be avoided similarly 2018 bombay high court had turned down anticipatory bail plea of two doctors a couple of them, a couple actually under section 304 of ipc where the doctors had given treatment uh, telephonically uh, in their nursing home besides this we are now also seeing states which did not have clinical establishment act till now suddenly have woken up and uh, have uh, notified by way of an ordinance clinical establishment act uh, as has been done in punjab thankfully it has been implemented only in 50 bed and above hospitals but clinical establishment act gives very wide ranging powers to uh, the authorities what i am not clear is the timing of uh, notifying this act in punjab seems more cosmetic because the hospitals even if they have to register they get some time and during that time probably this pandemic will already be over so what is the purpose of bringing it now uh, is a bit uh, of a dilemma next is the issue can government take over resources of private hospitals andhra pradesh uh, this was a news in et bureau economic times uh, on april 1 uh, they decided to take over private hospitals invoking powers under disaster management act placing the premises with all available resources and manpower at disposal of the district collectors as and when required there was this article recently in india today on april 9 can government uh, should modi government take over private hospitals to fight corona virus pandemic like spain spain has taken over and they took over at a time when the death toll was only 309 from about total 9200 uh, corona cases today spain has lost more than 15000 lives but they had already taken over private hospitals when there were only 309 deaths and we have to remember that spain has three hospital beds for every 1000 persons and 4.1 physician for every 1000 persons whereas india in contrast has 0.7 hospital beds and 0.8 physicians for every 1000 persons so this is an issue and the legal uh, basis is under section 65 of disaster management act the government has the power to requisition resources provisions vehicles etc for rescue operations etc authorities can requisition any resources men and material services premises vehicle for a period as may be required and section 66 says a reasonable compensation may be paid what that reasonable will be defined will we will come to know only later can doctors refuse or shirk covid duties section 56 i have already mentioned this any officer on whom any duty has been imposed under this act and who ceases or refuses to perform his duties without express written permission there is imprisonment up to 1 year uh, which is prescribed so government doctors uh, should be very careful and those private doctors or private hospitals which have been requisitioned by the government the same will apply hospitals have been shut down right and left whenever a patient has tested positive or uh, doctors have tested positive or staff members have tested positive and this is in itself uh, something which will need uh, to be looked into because this is not uh, feasible in the long run to lose medical resources which are anyway uh, we have a big uh, deficiency of Uh, in in this particular case the private hospital was shut and kgmu staff was quarantined but the kgmu hospital was not shut the, for the same patient similarly bangalore shut down three hospitals just now more importantly during this covid there is no exemption which still has been given to doctors or hospitals from prosecution for allegations of medical negligence during the duration of this pandemic and doctors are refusing now by law to see non covid patients because they are seeing only emergencies they have been told not to see non uh, emergency patients and providing their doctors have now been uh, asked to provide teleconsultation 
or not doing detailed examination of every patient hampered by the personal protection equipment. It is pretty difficult to each examine each and every patient in an OPD setting. Uh, this could later be dragged to state medical councils. Why should doctors action taken in good faith during these uh, difficult times not be indemnified? All officials and authorities act during such emergency with a protection accorded to them for action taken in good faith. Section 73 of Disaster Management Act and Section 4 of Epidemic Diseases Act specifically mention that no suit or legal proceeding will lie against an officer for an action taken in good faith under these acts. Unfortunately, even in these times, doctors have not been given any relief from prosecution for alleged uh, uh, negligence under provisions of Consumer Protection Act, Indian Medical Council Act, Indian Penal Code, Clinical Establishment Act, PCPNDT Act, Biomedical Waste Management Rules. By following the law as it is being dictated today, we are neglecting our regular patients, putting them at risk for complications, exposing our staff and non-COVID patients to COVID-19, and managing the patients of COVID with limited resources at our disposal. The professional acts of doctors today during this period is going to be evaluated and adjudicated by layerly judicial process many years later. Another basic problem is with litigation, we require to defend ourselves with medical records. But medical record keeping while wearing gloves and PPEs is cumbersome and unhygienic. We cannot keep changing our gloves with every notes we write. It is also not feasible to write all notes at the end of duty shift because law demands medical records to be written contemporaneously. Contemporaneously means as events happen. It has to be written in real time. Similarly, if we are doing electronic health records, use of keyboard while using wearing gloves is difficult and likely to transmit infection. COVID-19 has given enough challenges to doctors. Medical professionals do not need the added stress of violence against them or litigations in future, at least for the duration of the pandemic. Government needs to protect the doctors not only from violence, but also from suits or legal proceedings for cause of actions which arise during the period that Disaster Management Act remains notified. There are some issues which are still unclear. Is autopsy mandatory now during this pandemic for unnatural death, death on table or following injection or any medical intervention or where cause of death has, is not known? Because by law, autopsy is mandatory under these circumstances otherwise. And the issue will force major apply to COVID. What is this force measure? This is a legal term. Unforeseeable circumstances that prevent someone from fulfilling a contract. A doctor has taken a premises on rent to run the hospital. Is he within his rights to say that because of the pandemic, I could not run the hospital and uh, that's why rent should not be charged? Answer is no. We have to make the payments of full wages. We can't uh, refuse on the basis of force measure supply of goods and services at rates no longer viable. We may have signed the ECHS agreements at a time when we didn't require to wear a personal protective equipment for doing each endoscopy and uh, changing in between. But we cannot now change the rates once the contract has been signed. And the issue of uh, even in construction industry, whether contracts need to be extended, probably that will be permitted. Case laws related to contracts preceding war have cast the threshold to successfully apply for force major is very very high so courts do not easily agree uh, to this this uh, uh, interpretation of law so whatever contractual obligations are there of doctors you need to fulfill them irrespective of the pandemic thank you so very much well uh, thank you Dr. Napal for uh, such a deep insight into the regulatory aspects of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And before we proceed to our panel discussion, uh, I would like to take a short break to settle things down and uh, we will be back in less than a minute.
So welcome back uh, and uh, we have our panel of experts today. We have Professor J.S. Thakur who is a senior professor in Department of Community Medicine at PGI Chandigarh. We have with us Dr. Nagpal from Medical Legal Action Group and Professor Dato who is the head of the Department of Virology. So we will be, we will be trying to uh, ask them questions uh, as much as possible. So here we go with the first one. Uh, so the first question is alcohol uh, the 70 percent is effective for skin is it equally effective in disinfecting the personal devices that is mobile phone key and uh, locks yes uh, it's a very uh, interesting and important question because uh, this is the day-to-day -day community what we are using uh, and uh, very common uh, uh, like uh, instrument which is going to supposed to be contaminated so <clears throat> the most effective way it has been seen that uh, because you cannot spoil the instrument so this uh, alcohol rub or the disinfectants which has got usually people they say from 60 to 80 percent alcohol will be good enough when something has got a 70 percent alcohol it's definitely better with higher alcohol so this will be definitely better to have uh, disinfecting the uh, mobile phones because COVID-19 is known, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is known to uh, uh, disinfect, uh, destroyed by this uh, alcohol, this amount of alcohol. Uh, thank you, Professor Rato. And uh, we are joined by a lot of uh, professionals from varied specialities, and this is a common question from many of them. Uh, there are many procedures in medical science, uh, uh, let it be in uh, pulmonology or in dentistry or in uh, uh, ophthalmology where the doctor needs to work in a very uh, closed environment where there are some chances of aerosol generation or uh, you know the chances of contamination or cross infection is relatively more. So for such specialists are there some special precautions to be taken up? The uh, precautions, uh, mm, uh, the general precautions one has to keep in mind because uh, just we were discussing that use of uh, one is what is you have got a mm, uh, hand washing, second thing is uh, use of gloves, third thing is mask, mask is you have got a surgical mask and you have got a N95 mask. Then you have what, what you mean to ask is uh, targeting about on PP. So you have to keep in mind that uh, going to the, the last resource, the PP, one is to be very meticulous in deciding to what sort of uh, procedures we are going to do, what sort of uh, activity which is going to generate infectious material. So that has to be taken into account. If you mean that this procedure which has got aerosol, which is infective, and uh, like a patient dealing with taking samples from the patient or we have taken samples and then we are going to open that uh, uh, sample vial and going to work upon that uh, to test on that this type of scenario definitely you need full protection otherwise in normal activities you have to decide whether it is going to have a surgical mask or with n 95 mask it is good enough or without that so this is a uh, discriminatory component you have to decide yourself judgment is very important to do so taking the same question ahead i mean uh, if we have some aerosol generated at one place in a clinic so do we have to take precautions before the sec before letting the second patient come in so are there specific precautions to be taken yeah because once you thought there is a generation of these aerosols then you have to make the surface decontamination so we have discussed about the surface decontamination. Mostly the best effective method of doing this is sodium hypochlorite. 1% sodium hypochlorite. 1% hypochlorite. sodium hypochlorite. That's very effective. And you can mop the surface or spray the surface or sometimes we wash the surface with fluid depending upon the amount of uh, aerosol what you are expected to generate. Uh, so the question, the next question is, is it compulsory for nursing officers to take hair wash daily? who are working in ties of uh, CLR extension? Yes. I think in this situation it is better to take uh, hair wash daily or if that is not possible then we have you know a cap which is mandatory while if you are directly dealing with a patient or working in a screening OPD so in that situation uh, ideally, we should go for it, but at least we should wear the cap. 
in all our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, so the question is, uh, nowadays, mostly cases we are hearing, doctors are also infected with corona infection. They are all using PPE. So what can be the specific cause of infection to them? Wearing PPE is not uh, always going to protect you because uh, we, we are going to get exposure with many uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. So how to know that from where this infection has come? You are using the PPE at that particular situation when you are dealing with a patient or activity. Beyond that, so because it has an uh, infection rate so high, it is not difficult to pinpoint that. So can a Just reason be improper donning and doffing techniques being followed? Uh, can that be a probable reason for uh, being infected despite using PPEs? For uh, every activity, there is a set pattern. So donning uh, a PP is just like wearing a dress. So the way you don, nobody bothers because they are all not uh, uninfected. But now you see you have uh, performed a highly infectious activity where it is expected that we have got exposed or contamination on every surface with uh, on the dress whatever you have used with the infectious material. Now at this particular scenario when we are going to have doffing, taking out the materials, infected materials, it is definitely very very stringently one has to follow the rules or the procedure has been documented. It has to be practiced many a time because listening once or seeing once is not good enough because this activity it has to be a coordinated way so that a step gone before it is supposed to be done might get contaminated or infected. So that is a possibility that one has to keep in mind. Just to add uh, to what uh, Professor Atho has said, you know, uh, having adequate uh, personal protective equipment is very, very important. But at the same time, these universal precautions are to be followed. And it has been seen that, you know, people are not strictly following, you know, the universal precautions, even if you are wearing uh, your all adequate uh, protect, uh, personal protective equipments and people start, you know, roaming here and there, they are not using, uh, following the usual, you know, uh, put, uh, precautions which are required while, you know, wearing the mask and maybe going to a bathroom or going to take the food or going to a canteen. So we have to take into all these considerations that once you are, for example, in a COVID positive hospital, all your movements are restricted and you have to be placed at a place where you are posted. But usually it uh, does not happen and people start moving here and there and that, you know, expose the people for infection. Well, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, we have a question for uh, Dr. Nagpal now. Uh, it's a pretty sensitive matter. Uh, many of the healthcare workers are complaining these days that they are being asked to work in sensitive areas and that too without adequate protection. I mean, they feel that the protection is inadequate. So, do you have something to say about it? If we are employed by our employer, we are bound to the agreements uh, which the em employment agreement has been made. You have a problem tomorrow, you can sue the employer, that is a separate issue altogether. But government employees refusing duty, that is why I brought up that slide. Under Disaster Management Act, it is a criminal act. So you cannot refuse duties. It is your duty to keep intimating or asking for PPE or whatever protective equipment you require from your supervisor or from your senior. That much you should have documented, but to refuse to do duty is not uh, legally permissible. So uh, the take home message is uh, we should pursue the matter with the higher authorities of the concerned hospital yes. and make sure yes. that the guidelines, the late guidelines by the government of India and by the institute all those guidelines are meticulously followed and if there is a breach there are channels to i am getting complaints from people that ppe is being asked to be reused normally if you are having a ppe it is meant to be discarded after your duty but here we have situations where doctors or uh, even nurses are being asked to reuse 
once uh, you are reusing it, then it is a cosmetic uh, gesture only of using the PPE. Uh, Professor Rato, there is a question uh, regarding the reuse of N95 mask. You know, there are at some places it is recommended that we can preserve the N95 mask in paper bags and we can keep them for few days and uh, I think PGI has not taken up uh, such guidelines. So, but what is your stand on it? <laughs> to take your last uh, component first, PGI has not taken that is rightly they have done it because the Till now, there is no sure sort evidence that if you start reusing them, the, how much it is effective, how much you are able to destroy the virus. Is it sure that we don't have a virus inside it? That sure sort method or uh, policy well, method has not been like proven. So it is now really difficult to adopt that. We have uh, propositions, many uh, methods have been come up, people are proposing that it can have some effect in destroying the virus, keeping outside under the sun, how many days you will keep, what the temperature, how, what amount of UV light you are required from the sun to destroy it, they are all subjective. There is no substantial information, evidence. So that's why I think at this point of view, point of time, uh, it is always better that we, we should not use it unless we are forced to do it, where there is no other alternative. So then in that scenario, it will be different. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, Professor Thakur, since you are an expert in uh, community medicine, there is a, a question on fumigation. How, how effective is it and what uh, chemical has to be used uh, for, for the communities, you know? So fumigation is not otherwise usually recommended. You, are, you might be seeing that in these days in some of the roads also, you know, they are being fumigated unless there is a very high risk of infection but there are specific areas which need to be fumigated as we know usually these operation theaters are also fumigated so the patient areas they can be fumigated and for you know for specific uh, hard surfaces for example table chair or laptop as was discussed earlier also we need to do some you know, sanitization of uh, all these measures. And uh, I think, uh, Professor Atho, would you like to add something to fumigation? No, I think that's uh, good enough uh, <clears throat> because even sometimes back people used to have tunnels, spray tunnels, and then see this th knowledge is uh, evolving. So, Ministry so has come up with you now the guidelines, the guidelines. That these tunnels are yeah. not effective mm -hmm. and should not be used. So, that the, the, because we, we imagine something and uh, Propose that this can be effective. Once it is installed and started working, then we realize that this has got a side effect, which is a more uh, side effect than the beneficial. That's why you have to stop those type of things. So, yes. so the take home message is again that uh, uh, the knowledge is evolving and uh, we are learning more and more every day. Uh, Dr. Nagpal, there is a question uh, which is again a little sensitive matter. Uh, it's about the assaults on doctors and other healthcare professionals which which are sporadic but they are happening every now and then so are there specific laws against them 20 states in our country had passed prevention of violence act against doctors but this act uh, this these acts were never implemented i mean under rti we had taken information from government of punjab and from government of haryana all ssps and up till uh, around uh, 3 years 4 years ago uh, though these acts were notified in Haryana and Punjab in 2008 and 2009, up till four years ago, there was not a single case which had been filed under Prevention of Violence Act in Punjab. But recently, uh, after raising this issue a number of times, uh, we had one senior personnel from uh, the Punjab police and he informed us that recently in the past one, one and a half year, they had uh, filed 152 uh, cases under Prevention of Violence Act. So, uh, things were moving. The problem arose during this COVID. Uh, not only violence against doctors, there is an ostracization which has been seen which is uh, extremely painful. Uh, doctors being asked to vacate uh, tenancy, uh, their premises by the landlords doctors being assaulted if they are going for surveys and uh, 
this is something the government needs to tackle on a very very urgent basis though doctors in my view do not form an important section of the society as society exists today but the fact remains in a pandemic like this they are a very precious resource and you cannot afford to lose them uh, physically or have them withdraw uh, when, when they are not in a frame of mind to provide the services to the best of their ability. So it is very, very important that the government comes up with a central law or makes an amendment in IPC uh, making assault on doctors a cognizable offence in IPC and stringent punishments should be prescribed there because here you, you never hear violence against uh, let us say a judge or you never hear a violence against an SDM who is uh, going to because they are given that protection. But doctors are left alone usually and the, from the police side also they are, do not have that kind of uh, protection which is accorded to an administrative officer or to a, a judicial officer. Uh, this is something which needs to change because uh, if things carry on like this, there is a lot of resentment which is building up in the younger generation and a lot of younger generation is adopting paths which they are leaving the medical profession per se, uh, leaving the country. This had been happening even before the pandemic, but this pandemic brought out this other ostracization, which I feel uh, needs to be tackled on an urgent basis by the government. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Nagpal. And uh, uh, I believe uh, there are uh, lots, many of questions, but uh, because of time constraint, we won't be able to take all of them. Uh, this is the last question probably, which I am trying to ask uh, Professor Thakur, who is uh, working in the area of uh, COVID screening as well. Sir, how effective is the infrared thermometers? You know, uh, there is a tendency to use these thermometers everywhere these days. We found these thermometers outside the parliament, outside airports, you know, everywhere we are uh, seeing them. So we just want to know how effective uh, are they and what is the mechanism behind the, that kind of a screening? You know, this uh, thermal screening is basically used for detecting the patients with uh, the fever. But somehow, you know, these, there are many varieties of these, uh, you know, uh, thermal screening methods which are available varies from you know 5000 to say 90000 so while by buying these uh, you know thermal screening equipment we should see that what is the level of variation of temperature which uh, equipment that is what is the sensitivity of an equipment that is important criteria they are important tools especially in areas which are declared hot zone or the red zones because they are we need to find out these influenza-like illness cases where beside fever, sore throat, common cold, uh, all these uh, symptoms they need to be asked. So it is a good tool for screening and should be used provided we have a sensitive equipment available for that. So is it effective for every clinic, every hospital, people have started screening, uh, you know, people who are entering the society, so the society gets somebody is will be sitting with a thermal scanner and everybody entering into the society is being screened. Yeah, so whenever you have a public office where you or a hospital where there are many people likely to visit, it is better to have this type of uh, screening arrangement because you cannot say that who is infected and who is not infected. So it is better to have this type of screening arrangement. But again, there are two things to remember. One is it is not foolproof uh, because as we had seen, there were instances with the paracetamol, obviously the temperature will come down and uh, that might give a false sense of uh, protection or... Uh... Yes, so you are right that uh, it uh, is not a foolproof method, but at the same time from public health point of view, if somebody is having a high temperature, at least these people will be detected and they can be, you know, uh, taken care of and can be further investigated in a health facility. Well, uh, thank you, sir, for explaining uh, in detail. So with this, we have come to an end of this third webinar on infection control guidelines. And I want to thank all our eminent speakers, uh, Professor Arunalok Chakrabarti, uh, who 
who left because of some prior commitments and uh, uh, Professor J.S. Thakur, Professor R.K. Ratho and Dr. Nagpal. And with this, uh, I would also like to welcome you for our next webinar, which is a must attend event on 24th of April. And the topic is management of COVID-19. And we will be joined by uh, a, a new panel of experts consisting of Professor Ashish Bhalla, Professor G.D. Puri, who is also the Dean of Academic at PGI Chandigarh and Professor Nusrat Shafi. And uh, also I would like to flash on your screens, the PGI coronavirus helpline number, which is 0172 uh, This number can be utilized for all your corona related queries and also to connect with various experts at PGI. So with this, I am signing out. Thank you.